This week's episode is sponsored by LearnVest. Do you know if you're making the right financial decisions? Most people don't. So LearnVest has come up with an innovative approach to help you make progress on your money. Featured in Lifehacker, Forbes, New York Times, TechCrunch, and more. When you join LearnVest, you get unlimited access to money tips and lessons. Use their award-winning online money center, which is also available as an iPhone app, to connect your accounts, set up a budget, and track progress against your financial goals. You can talk to a money expert for free by booking a 15-minute session and getting information about retirement, debts, and savings. Your expert will be able to answer your questions and give you financial next steps. No jargon, just good financial advice. Head over to LearnVest.com slash smart people. It's completely free to get started. Your own free expert, that's awesome. Make progress on your money. Again, LearnVest.com slash smart people and create a free account. What are you waiting for? The podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to to smartpeoplepodcast.com. What's up, everybody? It is time to get smart with Smart People Podcast. I am Chris. And I'm John. John and listeners, I remember before I went into the sixth grade middle school, I remember the day before school, I was stressed out so much because it was the first time I was going to have to change in a locker room in school, and I was worried about it. Yeah, you had that problem, so... No, it was just... (laughs) There's no problem. I was just terrified, man. You're a young kid, and... I don't know. It just reminded me when we went through this week's episode, it just brought back all these memories about the difficulties of growing up, being a teenager, the angst, and then the highs, the lows. Parents, you know what I'm talking about out there. This week, we talked to Rosalind Wiseman, and she is the author of two amazing books about growing up, about what it's like to be a teenager, everything from bullying to love lives and sex all types of great stuff. Her book, Queen Bees and Wannabes, is actually the basis for the movie Mean Girls. It was bought and then turned into that movie. And then Masterminds and Wingmen, her most recent book, is helping our boys cope with schoolyard power, locker room tests, girlfriends, and the new rules of boy world. I want to know what the old rules of boy world were. That's a good point. Although, man, we'll kids to, these I, days, they're even crazier. Like, yeah. I, I don't, I'm terrified to have kids. It's way different now than it was for us even 15, 16 years ago. Yeah, that's pretty nuts. Rosalind's a true professional, and she's got a great background. John, why don't you tell them a little bit about Rosalind? Rosalind is an internationally recognized expert on children's, teens, parenting, bullying, social justice, and ethical leadership. National media regularly depends on Wiseman as the expert on ethical leadership, media literacy, and bullying prevention. It's just a really cool episode. It reaches out to a a wide group of people from parents, siblings, people going through it themselves. You might not think, I'm going to get a lot out of this, but just learning about the things we all go through, kids are going through. Yeah, I mean, she does some really cool stuff. She's actually an advisor to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. I mean, that's pretty impressive. She's doing good things. So we're going to turn it over here to Rosalind. Don't forget to check us out at smartpeoplepodcast.com. We get the posts up. Our last guests have been amazing as well. Make sure you check them out. And click on Amazon if you're making any purchases. Shoot some cash our way. No cost to you. Yeah, if you're buying Halloween costumes or even starting to prepare for holiday shopping, please make sure to use the link on smartpeoplepodcast.com. Here you go, Rosalind Wiseman. All right, Rosalind. Well, again, thank you so much for being on the show. I wanted to first dive right in and, and settle the debate once and for all on air. Which is the better sex, men or women, boys <sighs> or girls? <laughs> Well, geez, I don't know. Um, I am absolutely unwilling to make blanket statements about who is better. I think that, you know, um, I think that women can be really challenging and men can be really challenging as well. Yeah. And I know that's kind of 
the what your books, you know, both of them. So your last book, which was extremely successful, Queen Bees and Wannabes, and then your newest one, Masterminds and Wingmen, a common theme is really how intricate all human beings are, not just one sex versus the other. Exactly. And, you know, I think what was really important to me was I, you know, I've been working with boys for a really long time and it was so striking to me that people thought that boys were so simple and so sort of stupid and that they didn't have a complex emotional experiences. They didn't have betrayals or that they cared a lot if their friends did something horrible to them. I mean, I just, I just really could not believe um, how much people bought into the stereotype of boys that they would never put up with, with girls. Yeah, it's so, it's so funny too, because I agree with that statement and just having grown up and, and, been in you know locker rooms and on baseball teams and all types of stuff boys get a lot of you know they they mess around with each other they say harsh things and then a lot of people pretend they just brush it off but you often right, don't exactly. see behind the scenes that that guy still goes home and thinks oh maybe i should you know change my maybe i shouldn't wear cargo shorts the next day because i got made fun of for that or something like that you know <laughs> Well, I mean, in Masterminds, um, one of the stories that I think has been re resonating with people and, and, and really surprising people is a story that I talk about in the very beginning about a boy who goes to a swim party and he asks his mom, like, really casually to get, get him a swim shirt, but he doesn't say when he needs it or why he needs it, so she doesn't really think about getting him, you know, it in time for the swim party. And then he goes to the swim party and, you know, she picks him up and he's in a horrible mood and he goes home and he, you know, goes to the, you know, straight up to playing video games, chooses the most violent video game he's got at home and just starts to obsessively play. And the mom thinks that, you know, he's obsessed with video games and he's going to turn into a violent freak. And what she doesn't know because he didn't tell her is that when he was at the, at the swim party that, you know, his, some of his good friends were really teasing him about having man boobs, about having moves. And they've been relentlessly teasing him about this for months. And when you're in sixth grade, and we, again, we talk a lot about girls and their body image. We never talk about boys and the pressure they get for their body image. Yet, you know, you can't buy a Halloween costume without a six-pack sewn in it to it for a boy. That, you know, boys are under the same kinds of pressures. And we don't see it. So we, th we just totally misread situations that are right in front of our face. That's such a good point about the Halloween costumes. I've never thought of that. Oh, I'm 30 years oh, old and I yeah. still think about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> still feel well, I mean, those think pressures. Think about how, you know, compare just, you know, your thoughts about as, you know, when it's Halloween and parents are thinking about what is the difference basically that between getting their younger daughter, you know, when they're still in control of what they're wearing for Halloween, something that's cute and something that's inappropriate and like whatever word you want to use, trashy, you know, whatever. Um, hypersexual, whatever it is. But, you know, parents are really, a lot of parents are pretty focused on that. And so it's a, it's a conversation. It's something that we're used to having as a, you know, there are not all parents who are like this about girls, but it's not this crazy, weird conversation. Whereas with such a strange conversation for parents of boys that we don't even have it, it's not even a language to talk about it. Actually, while we're on the subject, I would like to get your take on the Halloween costume phenomenon of that for for girls which you know I was in college once and I got to say Halloween quickly became my favorite holiday because it's a free <laughs> pass for girls to literally wear anything and not necessarily be judged by the opposite sex I'm sure you touched on that in Queen Bee's well, I mean, I did I did talk about that in Queen Bees. It's one of the things that you see a lot in Mean Girls. And um, if I remember correctly, I think I think there's some like voiceover that says, you know, it was it's the one day that you have permission to be a slut and and look like a slut or whatever you want to call that, but not really get judged that way. Um, and I think girls, you know, even, we live in for girls. They're, they're constantly getting these messages about being hypersexual is going to get you valued and, and the most important kind of attention from boys. Um, but they also, again, have lots of messages coming at them from a, a lot of other messages saying, no, you got to like change the world and your body is not the most important thing about you. So they've got a lot of stuff going on. But for Halloween, it's, it's basically like immunity from being trashed or gossiped about or backstabbed by other, by other girls for trying on your sexuality. And 
there's really nothing wrong at all with girls. I mean, in fact, there's, it's all good for girls to be trying on and coming into their sexuality in positive ways. And there's nothing wrong with coming into your sexuality. The problem is, is that for girls, they're coming into their sexuality, living in a culture that wants to constantly exploit it. So it's complicated for girls. Um, for boys, it's, it's different. But for girls, you know, there's sort of, you know, there's layers of that for boys. It's, but it's, there's not the, that incredible pressure of, you know, if you take off your shirt, you know, as a guy and, and you know, you've got a six pack, not, you know, no one's going to tell you that you're being a slut or a whore when girls are taking off, if, if girls took off their tops, obviously that kind of stuff would happen. So it's, you know, for girls, it's that thing of living in a culture where they, they really should have the right to come into their sexuality, but they're doing it in a place where they often get exploited for it. How did you feel about the backlash that happened recently with Miley Cyrus and her performance, I believe on the MTV, <laughs> yeah, the, the VMAs, because, I mean, she caught so much flack for that, and a lot of people... I think people, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I think basically it's white America, for the most part, or a certain part of white America, not just like being really not understanding what has go been going on in like clubs for the last 25 years in <laughs> uh, around this country. I mean, you go into any urban, I don't mean black when I say that. I mean, any urban center, you know how people sort of make euphemisms for what they mean. I don't mean that. It's that <laughs> you go into an urban club and you've got all different kinds of, you know, men and women, all different races. Um, and that, that has been going on for a very long time. Miley is not starting this she is reflecting it she is imitating it so you know she didn't do anything that somebody her age if they go to clubs hasn't seen a million times before it's just that the people that were some people who are watching the VMAs I guess some journalists don't have never seen that and so it's really <laughs> shocking to them I, I get as a woman I think myself and as a feminist I think that there's that you know that I think a lot of different things about it I think okay if I'm her age it's a pretty rocky road coming as a Disney star and wanting to claim herself in that process. And that's going to be a rough road. And she's going to probably go back and forth between extremes. And that's the deal. And it's probably going to get a little, you know, it's going to get a little freaky for a while. But to turn on her that way, I think is, um, it's just so, it's just so silly. It's just so silly. And it's so not understanding of the culture that she is a part of as a young woman. Do you think that that had to do with the fact that she was a Disney star? I mean, if you look at Madonna, Lady Gaga, all these people, they do the same thing. They kind of get a free pass. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that we like to pretend that people are, you know, that they are as wholesome as the characters that they portray. I think that I can't even imagine the how how restricting it must be. I can literally cannot imagine how restricting it must be to be a young woman growing up as a Disney character. I mean, there's no, none of us would be able to understand that. The thing that I would want for her and for any woman is to be able to come into her own and be able to be proud of that. And, and pr proud of that, it, and also in the process being very self-reflective of your behavior in terms of, like I said before, like the culture that you are in. Because some people will say, well, she's, you know, she's co-opting the whole thing about women and sexuality and power. And you can go down that road. But I don't, you know, it's more, it's more complex than that. And a very, you know, she's on the cover of Rolling Stone right now. She's getting lots of attention. She's playing this for all it's worth because she's super, super savvy about how to do that. Yeah. But at the same time, that comes with a pretty high price. While we're kind of on the subject, Many of our listeners might not know that Queen Bees and Wannabes was the basis for Mean Girls. And in talking about how celebrities' stardom can affect a person, Lindsay Lohan since then has really dealt with a lot of things. And I was wondering if you had any take on that, having, you know, maybe seen it go down. Well, it was really painful. I mean, she's an incredibly charismatic, beautiful young woman. And... You know, she reminds me a lot of young women who are similar with that, who um, are talented, beautiful, charismatic, and, you know, are troubled. And it's really difficult for them to reach out for help for a lot of different reasons. And so, you know, to watch that from a couple steps away was, you know, it was pretty, it was really, it was really hard. And, but again, I guess for me, I work with young people so much that, 
you know, I always saw her as, as like many of the young kids that I work with, the young people that I work with, um, who sometimes have a really hard time, you know, getting focused and being able to do right for themselves. So I never, you know, I really didn't see her as, I mean, yes, it was being played out in a public, you know, the problems that she's struggling with are, are problems that a lot of young, that some young people struggle with. And, um, you know, that makes me sad for everybody, regardless of if they're public figures or not. Sure. Sure. No, I completely agree. The last question I had, and then I, I want to move into masterminds, but writing about girls is just as interesting, and we want to cover that, is I heard a quote the other day, and it was, it was really interesting because I'm getting married, and I've just moved in with my fiance, and a lot of things come up, and I realize I have no clue what to say. I don't know. I really don't understand women even after years and years and years, and I heard a quote that said, don't try to understand girls because they understand each other and they still hate them. And the only reason I thought that quote was funny is because and, – and just being you know, kind of brash is because they get this stigma of talking so much behind each other's backs and even friends will – when they're in different rooms will talk about their friends. Do you find in your studies that that stereotype, that generalization is true, that girls do that but guys don't? Or is that just something that's been popularized? Well, I think it's a really easy way to dismiss women and dis dismiss um, their friendships. And the way I look at it is that there's social connection is incredibly important to us. Like our friends uh, and our relationships with people is the reason that we get up in the morning. But it's it's really, especially when we're going through hard times. I mean, you, it's just, it is in just who we are as human beings that the way we get through life is being connected, having meaningful connections with other people. And, but at the same time, like conflict is absolutely inevitable and your good friends or friend, you know, whoever it is, they're going to do things that really piss you off. And so the problem is, is that we get to a, a place pretty easily where girls, as you know, to answer your question, don't feel comfortable being straight up with each other about what they're mad about. And so they trick themselves into thinking that if they sort of vent to their other friend or their backstabbing, they're actually doing something to solve the problem. Uh -huh. um, okay. And so when women do those kinds of things, when they have patterns of behavior where they get mad and they don't handle it in a straight up direct way, then it really impacts their ability to have quality friendships and quality relationships. It, this would go right to a relationship that a woman might have with a man where she's expecting a guy to read her mind and, and when she's mad or, you know, the guy says to her, are you mad at me? And she says, no. And clearly she is, but she it says something like, well, if you can't figure it out, then I'm not going to tell you. Well, that's ridiculous. And that's a <laughs> ridiculous way to advocate for yourself. So when I'm talking to high school girls, I say to them, look, you know, you're living in a world where lots of times people might try and silence you. And, you know, they might silence you. For example, you complain and a boy says to you, relax or don't be so dramatic. Don't be a bitch. But you have to advocate for yourself and you have to be able to say what you mean. But at the same time, and at the same time, you can't expect for men to read your minds. So that's equally unfair. So and it's not fair to you just as much as it's not fair to him. So you can complain about this and we can, you know, sort of not have the courage to handle our business and handle our conflicts face to face or handle them competently. And you can talk behind the people's back and you sort of think that girls are horrible. But really what's happening is like you don't, the result is you're not going to have the friendships that you want. And, you know, it's clear to me and it's clear to the, the young people I've always taught that friendships make your life way, way, way better. And having people that really have your back. It's just there's nothing like it, right? Like how do you get yeah. through the you know difficulties of life without your friends by your side? I completely agree. And I'd like to say just from my perspective that I also believe that a lot of that's true for men in general too is, you know, they still crave those deep-rooted relationships and to have those friends. I mean, I've known John since we were 10. And so, um, mm -hmm. you know, it does go both ways in that aspect. I'm sure you've seen that through Absolutely. your work. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, who would you, wouldn't it, isn't he probably one of your favorite people to just like hang out on the couch and like watch a bad movie with? Yeah. Like you're I, not, I hate to say right? it. You're like, yeah. you're not, like that's <laughs> bonding. You're not having some intense like conversation, but you know, it, like who better than to sit on a couch with and just do nothing. Right. That's what friends are for. Right. And that's a deep bond. No, it's true. I want to get into your newest book, Masterminds and Wingmen, which just basically does the same thing that you did for girls and does it for boys. And it's incredible. We were talking before we started recording. It's amazing to me how 
a woman, granted you have children and they're both boys, so you must know them very well, but you still didn't grow up in that body and in that mind. You <laughs> encapsulated so many of the idiosyncrasies. I was blown away. For example, one of them, you just briefly touch on wearing cologne and how in middle school, <laughs> you know, when, when boys first figure out cologne, they just douse themselves. But the key thing you said is most of the time by high school, the girls will have told them to stop and it, it'll, it'll self-regulate. And I was like, Oh my God, nailed it. Like it, you nailed it. So I just want to say to all the parents out there, you got to read this stuff. Thank you. But you know, the reason that I, you know, this book, this book has been frankly, frankly, really, really well received. And I think the reason is because I think if people had read it and it had only been my voice talking about what I thought about what was going on with boys, even though I worked with boys for a long time, if I just sat down and said, okay, well, this is what I think about boys, I don't think that parents of boys or men would be responding as strongly. I think the reason that people are responding so positively to this book is because I had boys read every single page on this book and say, okay, Here's what's good. Here's what's bad. Here are the things that like really annoy me about my mother. This is why I don't talk to her. This is the reason why my dad really annoys me. This is why I don't talk to him. Here are the reasons. Here are the ways I want to be talked to. Here are the things that are really bothering me at school. That kind of stuff. The boys vetted every single thing in this book. So there were lots of things I had gotten wrong, even though I'd worked with boys for so long. I mean, really, like I had worked with teenage boys for almost 20 years before I started writing this book. I was still getting lots of things wrong. So it was really about being in partnership, which is amazingly cool if you think about it. Like just I'd like this middle-aged woman and all <laughs> these teen boys got together and collaborated to write two books, you know, a book for parents. And then we have a high school book for boys that's free that boys can download like on iTunes and Amazon. And it's called The Guide, Managing Douchebags, Recruiting Wingmen, and Attracting Who You Want. That's amazing. I mean, it is because the boys helped me, right? That's right. the only reason why this book is any good. It shines through. It really does. And then the way you tell it is so good, John. Uh, I mean, what hope do you think that there is for parents? Because if parents have gone through growing up as a young boy or young girl, and they're still making the same mistakes with the assumptions and stuff, I know you had mentioned that there was a, a boy that – really wanted to hang out with a girl and walking out the door, I guess his mom like mentioned something about like this better not just be for like hooking up or that kind of thing. But he like really, he really liked the girl and wanted to bond with her and wanted to have that relationship. I mean, how are parents besides reading this book, how are parents going to learn these things and finally figure this stuff out, even going through it as a kid? So here's the things that that was really, that has been really surprising to me that I realized not from the boys, but from talking to men when I was writing this. And it happened last night after a book tour, after one of my book signings, that it seems like a lot of adult men have forgotten what it's like to be a boy. And that's weird to me. That's yeah. really weird to me. I don't know why that is. Like, that's a thing I got to figure out. Like, or maybe, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask men about that as the book, you know, as I get through this book tour. But, uh, you know, I have had so many men say the same stereotypical, frankly, demeaning comments about boys that reflects that they believe that boys are stupid, only care about sex, and only want to eat nachos. And it's, I, I really, I mean, no, I, I've never had, is that true? If I've ever had a woman say something like that, I don't, I, it's not coming to mind, say it that way. So, and then last night I had a guy come up to me who had th- two daughters and I think two sons. And he said to me, I never, I never, it never occurred to me that my son would have like complicated friendships or like problems in his friendships. And it was really incredible to listen to this. And so I I really want to, I guess what I'm hoping is, is it'll encourage, and this is happening. I mean, I've had a lot of men say to me that they, since reading the book are able to have better relationships with their son. And again, the book has only been out for two weeks, but there's some very specific advice that the boys are telling me to tell the parents in the book about how they want to be spoken to and also, and specifically that they do not want to be interrogated with questions as soon as the boys get home from school or get home from practice. I don't even think that's a parent and, thing. Um, and that's what parents are doing because, you know, <laughs> well, the, the only, the only you reason think it's an adult thing? I, I don't know. It's just even now I, I've told my fiance, when I get home, give me 30 minutes, just give me 30 minutes. And it, it doesn't stop. It's like, <laughs> if I don't interact instantly, what is yeah. that? 
Well, you know what? I think that people need to listen to what works to what what works for other people in their lives. And I actually had a father say to me in Cincinnati um, a couple of days ago. He said, "You know, I cannot believe." that I have been talking to my son when I see him after school, and I do. I ask him all these questions, and I know that when my wife does it to me, when I walk home, get, uh-huh. I get home from, from work, that the, I don't want to talk to her. I want to do is <laughs> like watch TV for a little bit. And he was shocked. He was like, I can't believe I'm doing this to my son. I did not realize I was doing this to my son, even though I complained about it with my wife. So I think we've got to be really self-reflective about – are you speaking to a person that you care about and are you interacting with them in a way that works? And if it doesn't work, why are you so invested in not listening to it, right? And if someone says to you, this doesn't work for me, I need some space, I need you to give me 15 minutes when I get home, then my question is, to my, like in this case, to parents is, well, why are you so invested in that? Because it pushes the boy away from you. And the boys will come forward if you give them a little space. I think that's an important thing. The boys were really adamant about sharing that with their parents. You know, I'm just, I'm really hoping that these two books, in, you know, in answer to your question, that the high school book, that the guide helps the boys talk to their parents and that, the, and that masterminds helps adults talk to boys and that, you know, in some small way that this helps the both sides, you know, communicate better with each other. I think it's really cool that you wrote the book for both sides because you really are empowering the boys to be able to speak up to their parents and say these things. And then on the same side, you're like arming the parents to know exactly what they mean by by saying things. I think it's really cool that you're putting the power in the hands of these young fellows. Well, you know, and I feel so strongly about this because all of the media that we see about boys is terrible. They're either video violent freaks, they're shooting up something, they're dropping out of school, they're slackers, they don't care about the world. Like, I mean, all of the images that we have about boys are terrible. And it's just simply not reflective of who these boys are. I mean, they're just much more than that. And we're really, and I, but I also think that they see what we say about them and how they're depicted and they disengage from us, and, they, and which I totally understand. And then there's a couple of boys, you know, in the minority always, but there's a couple of boys who always, who, you know, have the power and privilege and they use gender to abuse other people. And they think that humiliating other people, both boys and girls, is their right. And they think it's entertaining. And I really believe that the other group of boys don't feel that they can speak out to us about it because they don't have faith that we're going to be able to deal with it or we're going to be or we're going to back up the abusive boys. We're not going to be able to handle it or we're going to back them up. So I want the boys to be able to come forward and speak and stop being stop minimizing these boys and really see them for who they are. Um, and that's not only for their own emotional health and, and their ability to make the world a better, like contribute, make the world a better place. But I also, you know, want them to have, you know, there's a lot of girls in this world who would like to have really good relationships with boys, or there's other boys who are going to have intimate relationships with boys. They need to have functioning relationships. I completely agree. I was wondering, you talk a lot about, and we've discussed how boys get the rep for not talking about their emotional struggles and kind of just saying, oh, everything's fine. And I was wondering what your research has shown the reason is that boys are so unwilling to discuss it. Because I have my own personal opinion having gone through it, but I'm wondering if it's kind of on par with what you see. Well, I mean, I think it's a, a balance. I mean, it's a combination for, you know, for every boy. Like, you've got gradations of this with every boy. But, of course, the general sort of, you know, bell curve of boys is that they are like, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. I'm good. There's a couple reasons why. One is I think that at very early ages that parents make this weird leap in their minds that because you sit a girl down and she plays with dolls or does, like, imaginative play, like, role-playing stuff – and boys line up their cars and smash them into a wall that therefore and this is regardless of you know a lot you know parents political viewpoints or gender politics or anything like that that when boys ram things into walls or as they get older that they like to light things on fire or see things explode or like loud noises things like that that there's this leap a logic leap which is actually i think completely illogical that therefore this boy or this older child or this teenager does not have strong emotions about things that are meaningful to him. So we look at girls and they play with dolls and we say, oh, okay, well, they're relational. 
right? And there's actually a lot of evidence, there's a lot of statistics and things that I just don't think we're seeing boys in the way that we need to see them. But like girls are the ones that care about relationships. I think boys do, but they just show it differently. And we make this leap that they like to, you know, push cars around, therefore they don't care about their friends, which is just doesn't make, does not make sense to me. The second thing is, is that girls can say lots and lots and lots of words in a conversation and not a lot of authentic truth can be in any of those words. They can just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Boys can have very intense conversations that, in, that are like in total 10 words. And that doesn't mean, and this is where I think we make the mistake, and people and even men ridicule it um, or it justifies them actually sometimes not taking responsibility for things. But that you can have 10 words and those are very meaningful. They mean something. There is a transfer of communication that the other person understands. And I think because we think, well, that, that conversation was 10 words, that other conversation was 1,000 words, that there was a lot more going on in that 1,000-word conversation. I'm not sure that that's true. And I also think that we don't listen or watch the signs of what boys are doing to try and communicate with us because they don't like be telling people problems and then the pr- person is going to, quote, freak out. So it's, you know, they, they are very strategic about who they tell their problems to, and they really don't want somebody taking away the power to make decisions for them. And by the way, girls don't like that either. So I think that's part of it. And then I think the other part is, is that, you know, um, is that the culture is constantly telling boys that their emotional range is basically you get to be sullen, depressed, angry, or quiet. Like, you know, the sullen <laughs> kind of quiet, strong guy. You don't get to be passionate about things. You don't get to be enthusiastic about things unless it's like fantasy football or like you know, oh, I love that fantasy you football. Support. Like you can be passionate about those <laughs> things, right? And I, hey, I'm not knocking those things. I'm not I'm saying, you know, I work with somebody who lo- who's passionate about fantasy football. I've worked with women who are actually passionate about fantasy football. But it's it, you get a wider, you get to have a wider range of your passions. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of pressure on boys to have the emotional range of basically the superheroes that we are, that we have, that we see so much, except for Iron Man, right? Uh, well, that, I mean, he actually, he gets to be sardonic and sarcastic and that, that I include, that's, that's <laughs> part of that too. But it's really about being depressed, sullen, independent, and quiet, right? You solve your problems on your own. You never ask for help. You can, you can handle it and you either do nothing or you complete when you're angry at somebody or you physically dominate them. I mean, the thing you said about solving our own problems, that's what I always remember. It's like, I don't want to bother you with it. I'll figure it out. And I don't want you to try to take away the power for me to make my own decision either. Those two things, I think, hit the nail on the head. Well, and you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, gosh, we want kids being able to have that feeling. I want to solve the problem on my own. I want to be able to do that. It's just that, that we have to be able to teach our children and nurture them that everybody gets to a place where you're overwhelmed and you need help and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's a skill and a capacity to ask for help from somebody. Right. And the other, and the other part is, is that you can do things on your own and, and that's amazing, but you can also feel a lot of pressure as you're doing it. And that that pressure is okay to, to talk to somebody that's important to you about how you're feeling about it. Mm-hmm. That's a really important thing as they go through trying to solve problems on their own, which they have every right to try and do. They, we don't want incompetent boys who look to somebody else constantly for things to do. But one more thing is that we want them to solve, like boys want to solve problems on their own, but they also need to take care of themselves on their own, right? Like do their laundry, for example, <laughs> and I'm speaking as a mom, that that is a capacity that they have to learn to take care of their business, right? It's very yeah. important. <laughs> yeah. No, it's something that uh, I think took me a little while to learn, but eventually, you know, it makes you a better man. Yeah. I wanted to go through yes, a, it does. I, I wanted to go through a little bit of a you know for parents out there quick how do we handle certain things and get the almost audio cliff notes of the book so one thing I was thinking I constantly worry about whenever I get to the point of being a parent how do I properly discipline my child without pushing them away without being too harsh Well, discipline means to teach. That's what the word means. And so when you are thinking about how to discipline your child, which in opposition to punish, 
you're thinking about what the child did that was in violation of your family values in a very concrete way. You specifically state them or you ask your child at a certain age, like from like eight on or seven on, what did they do that was against your family values? And then you discipline the child according to what is something that you take away something that's meaningful to him. You express that you're disappointed and you, or you, you explain why. And the other part is you give him a path of redemption. You give him a path to feel confident, to feel good about himself again. So when you discipline him, but you say, but if you do X, Y, and Z, this is the way that I'm going to be proud of you. So that you're, you're, assess- you're holding him accountable, you are addressing it in a way that's going to mean something to him, but you're giving him back, a way back. And that also, by the way, repairs the relationship too. And so when you do those things, then you're able to walk that really difficult line of being an authority figure and holding your child responsible, not being their best friend, not being friend, but being somebody who is really clear that, that they feel safe around. You know, the relationship feels safe to them because you're consistent and they know what you stand for. Actually, that's a perfect lead in. My next one was going to be, how do you properly encourage honesty while also <laughs> maintaining the level of seniority, if you will? Mm-hmm. Well, I, for moms and for dads, I think being an ethical authority figure is extraordinarily important. And the way in which we are trained basically in this culture to express power often very much links to our gender, to being male or female. And, you know, as your boy gets older in particular, that can be really tricky because, uh, you know, there's the classic thing of the boy getting older and the dad feeling like he should dominate. And, Um, And the moms sometimes, not all mothers, but some moms will try, for example, to manipulate or make the son feel guilty. And that does not work. It really, neither of them work. So, you know, the domination mode for moms or dads just makes the boy, even if he does what you're saying, he does not invest or um, he doesn't invest in the rule that you're talking about. He's just angry and it's about, it's a willpower struggle and he's going to do what he's going to do sort of exactly what he, he's going to do it out of fear or he's going to do just what he can to get away with it or get you off of his back. But it's not going to teach him um, why, what the values are of what he did that you were against. And that's really important because we want kids doing things from a, set, a moral center, making ethical choices. And for moms, I mean, one of the things that's really clear to me that the boys said to me is when my mother cries, when she's angry at me, I do not respect that. I think it's weak. And I think she's trying to manipulate me. And I think she's trying to make me feel guilty. And I don't. I don't like it. And I think it's an incredibly important and difficult thing because moms, I think, feel like they get so frustrated and they lose power with their sons as their sons get older that they feel like they have to resort to manipulation or not being clear with their sons about what they want. It is 100% clear to me going through this process with the boys that they want mothers who can hold their own with them. And you know what? In Masterminds, the lying chapter is like 65 pages long because the boys are so complex about it. So basically, I just, you know, in a nutshell is to really figure out what was the motivation for the lie and then address it and discipline it from there because boys can have very different motivations for lying. One could be really that they're doing something bad and unethical and they don't want you to know about it. The other is that they're ashamed of something um, that they've done and they don't think that you'll accept it. So if you just address it just from the fact that he's told you something that's not true, you will completely miss. If you lump those two things together, you're not going to be able to handle it effectively. That really is great stuff. And your book is full of it. Like I said (laughs) earlier, I mean, it really does have some good stuff. And we will be sure to put that up on smartpeoplepodcast.com so anyone can go, you know, purchase it and take a look. Again, thank you so much for being on the show. I wanted to see for parents out there, for kids out there, where can they find more from you and where can they learn more uh, basically from what you write and what you put out there? Yeah, thank you so much. It's my website. It's rosalindweisman.com. But you can go to my Facebook page, which is also Rosalind, you know, Rosalind Wiseman. And my Twitter handle is Rosalind Wiseman also. It's pretty easy. That is keeping it consistent. Yeah. 
Well, thanks again for you know writing these books and opening this conversation. Oh, by the way, is there going to be a movie, the equivalent of Mean Girls for boys? <laughs> um, I hope that there is. I am meeting with um, my favorite movie company in two weeks, and we that is specifically what we are meeting about. That's amazing. Uh, that's awesome. I hope Good it comes out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Rosalind. Thanks so much, and best of luck. Thank you. All Take right. care, guys. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Welcome back. Hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Roslyn. If you enjoyed what she had to say, check out her website, roslynwiseman.com. You can find out all kinds of stuff about her, all the books she's written, all the publications she's written for. I mean, she's everywhere now when you when you look at her credits on there. It's crazy. Well, it's an important topic. Oh, it's super important. And you know, I often wonder, would you ever go back to do it again? I mean, in a second. Go back to being a teenager and just mooching off parents. And, I mean, uh, it was the most fun. Well, it I would was be think, beautiful. I was thinking about it earlier, actually. When you're a teen, in your teenage years, it's probably the, the decade, if you will, that you experience the most firsts ever. The most first anything. The first time you maybe drank, if that's what you do, or kissed a girl or drove a car. It's just cool stuff that happens. Yeah, and everything feels like it's the end of the world, and nothing really matters when you think about it. Yeah, you grow out of it. You grow out of everything. People worry about everything, and then you become an adult, and you're like, man, I should have enjoyed that a lot more. Anyways, hope you enjoyed it, guys. Head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com. You can sign up for our newsletter, which we will be sending out some good stuff for you there. John and I are working on an ebook that's going to be pretty cool. Uh, subscribe on iTunes, all that good stuff. Yeah, leave a rating and a comment on iTunes. It helps us out a ton. We're now over 300 ratings on iTunes. We've had like 150 comments on there. It's so awesome seeing you guys leave reviews out there, positive, negative. We really like the positive ones. Keep doing those. If you have negative things, email us. If you are still listening, I want to say, though, thanks to all you guys out there. You really have been amazing. I mean, we asked for reviews and you do it. Connect with us, you do it. Uh, We had the survey. We got great responses there. So we put good content out. We hope that you enjoy it and let us know what you think and connect with us. Yeah, and those of you that live in the D.C. area, we've been kind of throwing around an idea of having a live show. Let us know if that's something you want to see. Tweet at us, message us on Facebook, shoot us an email, all those ways to connect with us. so much stuff to do. Yeah, just let us know if you'd be up for it because, you know, if we get a handful of people that want to do it, we're definitely going to push for it. I hope you stopped listening by now. All right. See you guys next week.